You're listening to CIUT 89.5 FM, The More the Merrier with Donna G. I'm at the Toronto International Film Festival 2016, and with me is director Pete Travis to talk about his film City of Tiny Lights. Pete, welcome to tr- welcome back to Toronto. Thank you. It's a fun place to be for me. Now, you were here, um, you won the 2004 Discovery Award at TIFF. What's the experience been like since then? That was a big moment for me, um, my film winning that award. It kind of catapulted me up into places where I got to make choices that I wouldn't have been made to otherwise. So this festival's always had a special place in my heart, really, because um, that recognition of OMA was a big thing. Um, and that led to Vantage Point. Um, and it's nice to, c- to be invited back now with another similarly very personal film. Um, it's a special place to come. How did you get attached to the project? Um, soon after Ohm had finished, around about 2006, Addo, the producer, gave me the book of City of Tiny Lights written by Patrick. And uh, I, I loved the idea of it. Um, there seemed something compelling about a private detective whose job was to dig up other people's secrets or bury them, and he couldn't see that the biggest secret in the world was one of his own. Uh, that seemed like a really cool idea. and and set against um, the backdrop of London, which for me had never really been kind of portrayed as well as it could have been since the likes of films like My Beautiful Laundrette and Mona Lisa, which were the sort of touchstones for me, because I remember when I watched those films in the early 80s, it felt like a renaissance or a rebirth of British cinema, where you could do real subjects, but do them in a kind of beautiful, poetic way. Um, So I kind of thought I could do that with this. and there was something about the title. I just had this image in my head of a, I think I saw a postcard of a sort of picture of a city with lots of lights out of focus. And it seemed somehow that all of those lights were somebody's life. Um, and the city of tiny lights seemed to just somehow capture the magic and the, of what big, living in a big city could be like. Did being a social worker in the past influence how you shot the film? Um, Having done social work in the past doesn't influence the way I shoot the film, I guess, except in the sense that I'm sort of infused with a desire to be real and um, and, and I have a sort of... I hate things that feel fake. Uh, so um, I'm always looking for realism, I guess. But realism in a way that can be beautiful, you know, I sort of, you know, in the way that Magnum photographers photograph the real world, but they don't just... It's not just... They, they have a point of view. Um, and, and they look for sort of hope and beauty in the world. Um, and I guess I've always tried to do that. So this film, it, n- I knew it had to be beautiful. I wanted it to be beautiful because I think living in a big city is very sexy and exciting. Um, and I've never really been one that sort of feels that to be real means you have to be grim and miserable because <laughs> I don't feel grim and miserable. <laughs> I, I asked the question because some of the ways in which you shoot the street scenes with the kids and the back and forth, the youth center, um, are, are very realistic to me and very casual in terms of how the actors are behaving. Yeah, well, the kids are all real kids, uh, most of them who haven't acted before. Um, we spent a long time, I had a wonderful uh, casting assistant um, who spent three or four months trying to find those kids. So they all come from real places. Um, and they all understand what they were doing. Um, and the, so they weren't really having to act much. Um, and I think that's the secret, um, I guess. So I suppose, in a sense, it's not so much... I mean, I, I used to work as a community worker in a community centre in King's Cross before I was a filmmaker. And having had that experience, I guess, helps you understand how real things are so you don't feel like you're doing a movie version of it. Um, but it's really important to me that those things feel improvised although they're not uh, but they look like they are and it's that feeling that makes people feel like they're really there Um, but I think also the handheld camera is like another character in the story it's always been important to me that the camera has a point of view and that it feels like it's like it's observing real life but also a part of it that it's not cold and sitting back or it's not too fussy and making it look fake so all those things, I guess, combined with a sort of desire to want to make it feel as real and as natural as possible. Can you describe how you worked with your cinematographer, uh, Felix Wiedermann? Uh, City of Tiny Lights is the third film I've done with Felix. He's a genius. 
um, young man who's in his late 20s, early 30s. Um, I first saw his work for a film he did for television, which was achingly beautiful. Um, a story about a, a young black man that was killed by his friends, and it was poetic and wonderful. And I loved his use of light. He's got a, he's got elements of a sort of young Anthony Dodd mantle in him. Uh, and I've worked with Anthony, and I know how extraordinary he is. F Felix, Felix has got that same sense of ability to deal with light and use light evocatively. Um, and we've done three. This was the third thing we've done, and we just have a rapport, I guess. Um, and he understands the things I like and I know what, he, what he's really good at um, and when we look at stuff together we, don't t we tend to look at visual references that are inspiration rather than and try and make our locations feel like them depending on what, it, what, it, what, what the need is and also I think the camera needs to tell you the subtext of the story I mean being real doesn't mean I just show you a picture of something there's a very famous phrase about well, if a picture doesn't tell a story it's not worth taking um, Felix gets that um, and that's why I've loved working with him. Definitely comes across, and you, you're so right. Um, the City of Tiny Lights, that image, uh, you definitely gave that in the film because I got it immediately uh, from the first shot and then subsequent shots of the city and you know how this is just one section of a huge, vast city that, that comes across. Thank you. No, I think you know, living in a big city is sexy and scary and can be very lonely. Um, but I think there's something in it about making connections that if you're open to it the things that you thought were your family and your friends can change when you're in a big city you can meet people you never imagined you would meet have encounters you never would have imagined you might have and your life can be open to a different path if you're open to it and in a way I suppose the film's a metaphor for that Tommy's got a, you know, a past that he's frightened of and he's living in a sort of grotty hovel with his dad who's a drunk and it's like, will he be brave enough to sort of find the pieces of his past that can be hopeful and forge a new kind of future? And in a way, I think that's kind of a metaphor for a city, especially now where, you know, property and money is taking over places and, and forcing ordinary people out of places where they used to live. Um, I mean, part of the problem in London these days is there's loads of property development that's owned by people that don't even live in England, um, you know. And it's a scary thing when those things happen. It's like... I think sometimes you have to ask the question, what, does, what is progress supposed to be? We're supposed to love shiny new buildings. And that's great, but the question is, who's actually going to live in them? <laughs> what are they going to do? And who's the people that they displaced? Those kind of questions don't get asked enough, I don't think. And we, we're in our own little subtle way trying to go, why are we doing this again? The same thing is happening here in uh, Canada's large cities as well. Uh, for Toronto, the development the, is, it, is it a boom? Um, my own neighborhood in the past five years has got at least 13 condos going up and there's more planned and they're sort of destroying the reason people wanted to live there in the first place. I, I, think, I think it's important that we are brave enough to question this sort of material progress that's sort of sold to us as your, your city's becoming a bright, having its own bright new future. The question is, is it whose bright new future is it? <laughs> exactly. Uh, it's not... It's, it's not always the bright new future of the people that used to live there. Um, it's a bright new future of people with money, and sometimes those people aren't even people with money that even live there. So I think there's lots of hard questions to be asked about that because I think cities all over the world are, are finding themselves subject to sort of property booms, and everybody says it's amazing and how beautiful it all makes your city look. But I always go, well, beautiful for who, really? <laughs> exactly. So you mentioned the character of Tommy Akhtar, played by Riz Ahmed. You couldn't have found a more perfect actor. It was always Riz. Um, even in the early stages of development, you know, four or five years ago when I first met him, there was never anybody else who was going to play it. Um, you know, even I saw him even in his very early work, like Three Lions, um, a sort of tough vulnerability that he has. Um, it's c the kind of quality that the likes of Russell Crowe and Denzel Washington have, a sort of manly man that, that's not afraid to be emotional. Um, and that's that's in pretty short supply, I'd say, everywhere in the world in terms of movies these days. And Riz has just got it. He's just got it. Um, he sort of he's kind of effortlessly tough and cool looking, but he's not afraid of his heart and his emotions. Um, and he's got the most beautiful, soulful eyes you can imagine. It's like 
men and women can stare at him all day and you know and just wonder what he's thinking and that's that's an extraordinary quality for an actor i think um and he's got the ability to control it and play with it and use it uh, and that's so, that's so rare so it, there was never anybody else um we almost ri we almost wrote it for him i'd say um you know he made a commitment to our film four or five years ago before he was the huge star he is now and all, all credit to him he stayed with that commitment even when i'm sure he had other pressures on his time than making our small little film that probably didn't pay him very much money that he stayed true to that commitment because he loved the idea of what the film was about and because in a way you know um this is a film about voices that don't normally get heard um and there aren't many i can't think of another british film where there's a sort of young 35 year old asian leading man where the film's not about his social problems he's just a guy with Ex a job. exactly he's, he's, just a, he's just a guy with a job <laughs> that's the story <laughs> exactly it's not about um exactly being you know uh from an ethnic background at all um it's part of him and but the story is about uh, the private detective who's hired uh to find this friend of a a, a prostitute and where that and where that leads him yeah he's got a very important line in the story his dad's sort of you know comes from uganda and fled from there uh in the after you know from I from idi amin and feels britain has a certain beauty to him but he still feels like an immigrant his dad tommy's second second generation he's british he doesn't he doesn't accept the stuff his dad talks about anymore from him it's like he's he's just british uh it doesn't matter where he where his dad came from um and i think it's important that you tell stories about people regardless of their race and their color or their sexuality that are just stories about them um where they're not defined by the story's not defined by what they look like um because it feels a bit limiting to me that we do that 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 you know diversity in casting should also include diversity of storytelling you know where we tell stories about people whose lives we never see where they're not stories about whether they're sort of you know terrorists or drug dealers or or whatever they're supposed to be but actually just people in love people that have jobs people that can't get on with their mum and dad you know just like ordinary stories and i think we've got a long way to go to change those things but it's important that we do i think yeah and both those elements come out you've got the sense of community but you've also got the noirish aspect of, of Tommy being a detective, uh, drinking scotch, and uh, you know you've got the the femme fatale, and you've got the dark lady um, involved, and uh, also the the deeper element um, of of who else is involved in this woman's disappearance. Yeah, the 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 noir is just the way to tell the human story. It's you know it's you know vantage points of action movie. Um, City of Tiny Lights is a sort of noir thriller, but it's got a human story at the heart of it. So all the you play with all the tropes of it because it's part of what people are excited about when they watch a sort of you know a, a crime thriller in a sort of Raymond Chandler esque way. Um, but at the same time, you hope in the same way that Chandler's stories were very optimistic and and romantic, that you can tell an optimistic romantic story and still keep all of those things because they're fun to watch and it's it's fun to sort of chase chase the rabbit and see who did what they're supposed to have done and whether they didn't do it or did do it but at the same time you need to have a clear grasp of the emotional landscape of your story um and for me it was always important that you know not everybody's going to be a private detective and not everybody's as effortlessly cool as Riz Ahmed <laughs> sadly no we're not but we can all, we were all 17 once and had dreams about what being a kid was like and what we thought our futures would be and then you all get to 35 and wonder what happened to those dreams and whether whether you lost them along the way somewhere and whether you lost the people they were attached to even and what you can do about that now and and maybe the f people that you thought were your friends won't always be your friends forever but, but does that really matter you make new friends tomorrow that could sustain you over the future and i think it's in a way that's a, that's a universal story so in a way we wanted to use the sort of genre of noir which i've always loved um when i when i was a kid my mum and dad used to on Saturday nights for us was always going to my relative's house and sitting and watching my mum and dad fall asleep and watching old black and white movies of Humphrey Bogart, uh, you know, solving a crime. Um, so I've always been influenced by that stuff and thought it was exciting to try and use that genre to tell a sort of very human story about what living in a city was actually like. You've got um, Roshan Seth uh, in your film. Was he always on the list as well? There was never anybody else other than Roshan. It's the same with Riz. After I'd met Riz and 
told him I wanted to do it. We pretty soon after that met Roshan and did the same. Uh, well, the sort of you know the sort of if you look at the history of films and look at where you think they came from, um, I was heavily influenced by you know my beautiful laundrette and Mona Lisa, and Roshan was in my beautiful laundrette. Yeah. Um, so he's pretty much playing a sort of the same dad 30 years on <laughs> to a certain extent. And he again when I met him totally loved the project and totally loved the idea of it and stayed true to it over three or four years when other things could have come his way. But again, there was never anybody else going to play Farzad. How has um, the reception been um, to the screening of City of, Light, of Tiny Lights? Yesterday, the first the world premiere was awesome. Um, everybody laughed at the right bits <laughs> and looked genuinely shocked when it was supposed to be shocking. Um, and the kind of denouement went down really well. It was kind of satisfying to watch. I love the Ryerson Cinema. It's such a huge space, and there's like 1,200 people there watching it on a big screen, and it's just really... It's like you can hear a pin drop during it and then sort of riotous laughter and applause when there's a big denouement, which worked really well. So it's a lovely place to watch a movie with people, and they seem it seemed to play really well. It was really exciting. You need to go to Ryerson Theatre when there's a Midnight Madness. Yeah, I was, uh, I was here with Dread from Midnight Madness, and it was mad. <laughs> um, I don't think City of Thunder Lights is quite a Midnight Madness movie, but no, in that one people were screaming out and shouting at the screen all the time. It was pretty cool. I'm glad you've experienced it because it's definitely a, a different yeah. uh, energy audience there. Audience participation cinema is great. Yes, it is. Um, the, the film is beautiful. Uh, the movement is beautiful. Um, tell me about you know, is working with you. Is it your cinematographer, your editor, to get those lovely uh, sort of blurry, passing, moving shots? Uh, the blurry stuff is, is um, kind of a, an example of a bit like stop-go animation where you sort of change, you change the, the, the speed and the camera shutter angle so that it kind of slows the rest of the thing down except the person that you're filming. So it's sort of, um, it's like if someone's running, uh, you, the camera can follow them and they're in focus, but everything else around them is, is, not, is out of focus. So we just found that technique. Uh, Wong Kar Wai used it a lot in his early films. And me and Felix really fell in love with it uh, and thought we could find ways to do it, to capture something of the beauty of the city, uh, I guess. Uh, the energy when Tommy needed to be frantic, it works quite well when you've got, there's a sort of action sequence where some guy chases him down a lift with a gun. And it worked really well there because it got the frenzied madness of being chased by somebody with a gun. Because I've done lots of car chases and explosions before that have been very realistic. And I quite like the idea of being slightly more emotional with the camera. And I thought that allowed us to do that. So that's all done in camera, that, that stuff. It's not, that's not a visual effect that's added afterwards. That's just... Uh, the way the camera sort of just you can just you can change the shutter angle and the, and the speed to make it look like that. You planned the past with the young Tommy and the older Tommy really well. Can you tell me about um, casting those uh, young actors who's playing Tommy and his friends from his youth? Well, I think one of the things that I'm most pleased with is the way the past turned out. Because I, I, I always had doubts, to be honest, as whether we'd probably just end up cutting the past out altogether and be so bothered about the thriller in the present that we wouldn't have space for it. Um, but the young actors that played, uh, young Shelley and young Tommy specifically, and young Lovely, they were captivating. Um, the love affair between Tommy and Shelley, the way uh, those two young actors played it was just achingly beautiful. Um, uh, Hannah had just gone to drama school uh, so this was her first she'd, she'd barely done any, that much acting but done enough just to get to drama school so this was her first job and she was just extraordinary um, and then the young lad that played young Tommy again he had that he had Riz's eyes which was uh, extraordinary again uh, again and he had a sort of stillness to him and he was very he hadn't done any acting ever before um, so all the kids were all cast by our sort of youth casting age uh, director, I guess. She went off and found loads of kids, and I must have seen hundreds of kids for the young Tommy and loads of girls for young Shelley, and those two were just stand out. Um, Hannah's gone to drama school now and is, and, is, and, is, and is working. I'm not sure whether young Tommy's gonna wanna carry on doing acting, he just loved doing it that once. But again, it's really important. We, we searched all over to find those two kids. Um, and if you're gonna get that kind of quality, you need to spend a lot of time looking for it. 
I'm glad you kept those elements because the movie wouldn't have had the same feel if you had cut it. And normally I, I hate flashbacks because I think, oh, it's a waste of my time. Um, show me some somewhere, some other way. But in this, in this sense, your flashbacks were absolutely beautiful. Yeah, I think, I think it's, when you look at it now, it's, it's impossible to imagine the film without them. Um, because without that innocence, you don't know what it is that Tommy's lost, because um, and you don't know, you don't know why he aches for that, for that to come back. Um, so when so when Shelley walks back into the present, from her you know twenty fifteen years later, um, if you don't see what they were like when they were seventeen, you don't really know the ache of what that was like. You don't if you don't feel the first time they kissed when it was supposed to be sort of wrong, you don't know why they feel guilty. And the truth is, they didn't do anything wrong. You know, they just fell in love with each other when maybe, and didn't do, you know, that's all they did. Um, and, but they felt a terrible guilt about that because of the implication it had for one of their friends. So there was something really innocent about what they did that I think really captures the sort of breathlessness of being 17 and falling in love for the first time. I think it's sort of, I love watching that part of the film now because it's so tend tender and sweet, but not so, not sort of sentimental. But actually, they both look vulnerable, you know. Because Shelley plays this. I mean, Hannah plays young Shelley as a girl that's kind of beautiful. Everybody wants to be wants to be with Shelley, but it's like none of the other men, and certainly her boyfriend, doesn't really see her. He just sees what she looks like. He doesn't see the shy girl beneath the gorgeous exterior who just wants someone to listen to her. And Tommy's the geeky teenager who, he's not the most attractive looking kid in the school, but he knows how to listen. And she finds that endearing. And it's just, re I just really like the fact that there's a sort of, you know, there's a beautiful girl that feels misunderstood and actually she falls in love with the geeky lad who then turns out to be the beautiful man in the end because um, you don't get many more men more beautiful than Riz. So it's kind of it's sort of a sort of you know the ugly duckling turns into the swan story. <laughs> uh, Pete, it was a pleasure meeting you and talking about this film. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's been a real pleasure.